Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, um, wherever you're joining us from around the globe. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we're very excited to have you here. My name is Shegun Fanero, and I'm the publisher of the Construct Africa platform. So for those who don't know Construct Africa, we provide news um, analysis on construction, infrastructure, and the built environment in Africa through our website at www.constructafrica.com. Today's webinar is the third in our Building a Better Africa webinar series, and today's discussion topic is Railway Infrastructure Development in Africa. Well, um, these are generally exciting times for uh, the real industry, the real sector in Africa. Um, this webinar, today's webinar, is happening in the same week that Tanzania has just launched its first electric standard gauge uh, train services. So Africa's real sector is on the cusp of a renaissance that's driven by growth in the extractive industries, but also by an urgent need to decongest roads and urban areas. And so we have governments all across Africa looking to both modernize legacy rail networks, but also to develop new greenfield rail lines. And we also see landlocked uh, countries across Africa seeking quicker and more efficient routes to markets. However, despite the significant contributions of uh, rail infrastructure to the economy um, and to regional con um, connectivity, there are still challenges that are hindering the continent's railway potential. So in today's webinar, we'll be exploring the pivotal role of, of railway infrastructure in transforming uh, transportation right across Africa. During the webinar, you can submit questions through the Q&A uh, function, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the panel discussions during which panelists will answer questions that have been submitted. There will also be poll surveys, which will pop up on the screen as we progress through the webinar. The results of the polls will be displayed periodically as we move along through the session. Uh, we were meant to start with a keynote presentation, uh, but unfortunately, our keynote speaker is having some technical issues at their end. Um, and the plan was that after the keynote presentation, we'll then sort of have three uh, panel um, um, segments. Panel one will be discussing the topic, transforming the rail sector in African countries. Panel two will discuss the topic, challenges and opportunities in delivering railway infrastructure projects in Africa. And panel three will discuss the topic, financing rail infrastructure projects uh, in Africa, challenges and solutions. I'll be introducing the panelists at the start of each uh, panel session. Well, since we're not able to start with the uh, keynote presentation, I'll sort of skip the, uh, the keynotes and go straight on to uh, panel one, which is transforming the rail sector in, um, in Africa. So I'll start by introducing our distinguished panelists for panel one. Uh, the panelists are um, <laughs> Mesela Inlapo. Mesela is the chief executive officer of the African Rail Industries Association. She's an influential leader in rail and transportation in Africa, and she has over 20 years of experience during which she has significantly advanced African rail transportation, covering areas such as safety policy and technology integration. Mesela champions the Luxembourg Rail Protocol, uh, promoting sustainable open access rail networks across Africa, and aiming to enhance trade and economic growth while fostering regional connectivity. Mesela, you're welcome to the webinar. Our next panelist on uh, panel one is Hank Hamsey. Sorry, Hank Hamsey. I need to get your name right, Hank. Uh, Hank is the CEO, the Chief Executive Officer of Elogium, an industrial machinery manufacturing firm based in South Africa and they specialize in 3D printing. Uh, he has developed a model to assist customers in adopting 3D printing as part of their future strategies. And one of the key industries that benefits greatly from adopting 3D printing um, 
from Hank's uh, perspective and the work which they've been doing is the real industry due to aging fleets and the availability of spare parts. So Hank will be talking more about that today. You're welcome to the, web uh, to the webinar, Hank. Thanks again. Uh, next is Professor Kumbulani Mpofu. Professor Mpofu is Professor of Industrial Engineering and holder of the Gibela Research Chair in Manufacturing and Skills Development at Shwewani University of Technology in South Africa. He's an academic leader and a consultant in advanced manufacturing, expert systems, artificial intelligence, robotics in manufacturing, and, me and mechatronics. Welcome to the webinar, Professor Mbufu. Thank you, Doc. The fourth person on the uh, panel one was meant to be Bruno Tandio, the Managing Director and CEO of the Tanzania Zambia Railway Authority, Tanzania. Unfortunately, he is unable to join us today um, due to um, an emergency requirement, and he sends his um, apologies. So I'll, I guess I'll kick off uh, the panel one discussions um, with a look at you know, policy reforms and institutional changes uh, that are required to further enable and accelerate the transformation of Africa's railway infrastructure. Um, I'll be directing this um, first question to Mesela in Lapo. And um, question being that um, from your perspective, um, what specific policy reforms or institutional changes are needed to accelerate the transformation of Africa's uh, railway infrastructure, addressing issues uh, such as interoperability, technical competencies, and capacity building? Uh, Mesela, you want to? Okay, I mute myself. Um, thank you. Um, thank you very much for for this opportunity to talk about uh, something that is very close, a topic that is very close to my heart. Um, integrating the continent and, and um supporting the vision of the CFTA and the Africa we want. I think that um as a as, as, a, as a sector, a uh, railway sector, regulation and policies have become uh, uh, a, an important instrument for effective uh, 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 railways. And um, there the, the needs to be, the, 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 an effective railways needs to be um, underpinned by robust regulation and policies that foster a conducive environment for private investment and efficient operations that goes hand in hand. But the country's regulatory framework must ensure that there's transparency, there's fair competition and accountability, creating a stable foundation for long-term growth and development in the rail sector. And I think that when we look at the rail sector, um, it, it's not about the southern hemisphere, but it's about the continent. How do we work together with governments and to ensure that um, we, the policies that are put in place have the best interest of people at heart, our brothers and sisters on the continent, and how do we make sure that the economy, the, the policies also are balanced to attract investment. And uh, for me, it's important with um, uh, cross-border uh, 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 rail interoperability. At a SADC level, we still function on um, the Cape Gauge. Now, the standard gauge that is coming in. And my worry is, is that we need to develop technologies that will be able to allow the current uh, rolling stock, that is Cape Gauge, that can work on a, on a multiple uh, of, of, uh, of gauges throughout the continent. So that interoperability is going to be key to support the, the railway, uh, the infrastructure, investing in infrastructure, and having a seamless uh, connectivity throughout the, the continent. And I uh, think in terms of um, what in initiatives that we, we need to, to to use in, in Africa to increase um, rail, rail um, um, participation. And I think that to increase rail transportation is we need to ad address the prevailing 
lack of confidence and several initiatives that are undertaken to enhance reliability, safety, efficiency of rail services. An investment in modernizing rail infrastructure and modernization must not be interpreted as there's something better somewhere else in the world. We are Africans and as Africans, we have our own way of doing things. We need to make sure that whatever um, modernization that is put into place is Africa-centric, can, can, can answer the African questions and allow African people to be part of the solution. And I think the days of um, looking into the entire world, Europe, US, and, and many other uh, uh, countries should come to an end. For us as Africans to, to, to be integrated, we need to work with partners that don't treat us as um, the, the, a country that, a continent that needs help, but rather partners that wants to, 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 to work with, uh, with, with Africans. And in the, we, on the technological side as well, uh, the, we, we need to find technology and, and invest in technological spaces in our youth to ensure that we respond to the call of making sure that um, the, the Africa we want, the Africa that its economic development will rely on the potential offered by Africans, particularly its women and youth. We need to bring that to life in our investment opportun opportunities. And um, I'll just uh, pause it there for now, but there is a lot that uh, we need to do from the policy perspective. And- um, <laughs> It's a morning for me. Uh, yeah. But uh, the team in Cape Town uh, with Johan. Uh, uh, I think. Tristan can we all mute, can we all mute the microphones, and, please? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the team with Amit and uh, Lisa and. Uh, can Anna, you, can you mute, uh, please mute everybody? I signed please, uh, in Cape Town with TFR uh, a service contract for 12. Thank you very much, Mesela. Uh, thanks for um, your comments and observations there. A couple of things I picked up there uh, in particular that you, um, you talked about, um, the issue of interoperability, um, but also you talked about the issue of, you know, um, having sort of African solutions for the peculiar sort of African uh, problems. Now, talking about um, the issue of in, in, you know, interoperability, um, that's that's very per, um, pertinent um, in the sense that you know um, we have all these sort of legacy you know railway systems. Um, we also have new systems um, coming on board, and we need to have you know sort of them speaking with uh, you know with each other. But apart from that, when we are looking at cross country you know rail systems as well, or even intercity you know um, rail. You know, we need to sort of have them um, speaking with each other. Um, so I guess one question that sort of naturally comes up is how are railway operators and regulators, you know, in a sense, collaborating to establish these um, common standards? Um, are there any sort of particular protocols, standards, um, you know, technical solutions that have been you know, developed, you know, to address these issues of um, interoperability? Um, um, Professor Mpofu, I wonder whether you have anything to um to to chip in um on this topic. Uh thank you so much um for 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 the summary and also thank you to Marcella for I think raising valid points um around the the question. I think from my end definitely there is an opportunity for us to to work with the Continental Free Trade Agreement, uh, I guess more be more deliberate. I think in 2015, 16, if I'm not mistaken, South Africa was declared to be the um, rail manufacturing hub for, for the continent uh, in Addis Ababa by the African Union. 
and 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 I guess uh, like many of the many of the declarations that do take place we either take forever to 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 get to implementing them or sometimes never get to implement them and as a result the consequences are dire because then the impact that could have been realized by the the continent and its people is lost um and and i think the 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 reality also is we've got a very high uh, unemployment uh, state generally in the continent and and it's sad um earlier on one of my colleagues here was on the panel was saying uh, we met in one country and 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 they they had a new rail infrastructure but but sadly because maybe the, the policies are not appropriate for ensuring that the development of, of these projects is done in a way that is sustainable um, for the, the continent, even in a gradually developmental trajectory. I mean, if, if there are components to be made, there are some components that are so simplistic. You, you, you ask yourself the question, why are, especially from a manufacturing perspective, because that's the angle from which I look at things from, why are parts that are so simple being produced thousands of kilometers away when they could have been produced here in the continent and created an economy for, for our young people to, 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 to have jobs, you know? Not, not just to have jobs, because my, my approach is also focused on the entrepreneurial dimension of, of of what we're doing, you know, how do we embrace entrepreneurship as we build up on this rail infrastructure? I mean, right now, the there's the integrated railway system that is being planned for the continent, and and yes, all of us are excited. Um, maybe it speaks to the sustainability questions, but those sustainability questions, one of them besides the environmental aspects, is the is the social aspect, you know, the social sustainability. And 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 we've got a beautiful platform with rail infrastructure to to deal with the social sustainability dimensions that um the continent faces. And and unfortunately, um we 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 don't design those policies such that we can speak to that and 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 the 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 with all these huge uh, infrastructure investment projects it's 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 the young people in the continent who who stand to lose and 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 i think we, we need to get to a place where um we are aligned through our leaders in terms of ensuring that uh as, as we develop these kinds of projects as we construct these kinds of projects uh the entire value chain not just the change um, at some menial point in the value chain uh, comes back to the continent, but holistically, and I guess this also maybe speaks to other dimensions of 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 of, you know, the 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 the, the integrity with which we do transactions because sometimes these things are really lost in at that level, and and we can say all we want here, but if 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 there is no um, um honesty at at the highest levels where decisions are made, then. Um, our, our talk is not really going to help us and this then also impacts other businesses that are in the continent um, as represented here who then lose out in terms of the opportunities to uh, you know grow opportunities to strengthen their uh, market share even in the global uh, context of trade because with all the developments that we have here in Africa we've got space for us to develop our organizations, develop our young people, and strengthen the African economy and ensure that the 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 the, the GDPs of the various yeah. nations that are participating or of all the nations in the continent also have a fair share um, that comes with implementing such strategies. Maybe let me pause the, pause there to allow the other panelists also to chip in. Thank you so much, Dr. Faner Faneran.
Thank you for that, um, Professor Mpofu. Uh, thank you for that. You know those very enlightening comments, um, particularly regards um, the um, the requirement for integration um, and also some of the, the things which we, we should be expecting, you know, from the governments and you know the other bodies to um, put in place. Um, we now have our key keynote speaker. Is he's here? But um, I think what we'll do is to finish our panel one discussions. Um, and then we'll have the keynote after panel one before we proceed to um, panel two. So um, continuing on this um, trajectory of looking at, you know, technologies right now, we we're talking about interoperability, um, um, talking about policies, um, continuing on this trajectory of technologies, um, I'm going to ask Hank Hamsey, um, who has been looking at the application of you know some specific technologies um and their transform their transformative impacts on the future of real world patients and management in Africa. I would ask him to you know to to speak and I think he has a short presentation he wants to show as well. Hank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take you through um additive manufacturing or, or 3D printing as one of the um, technologies that is um, very profound in the fourth industrial revolution and that has made a huge um, impact on the railway um, infrastructure and systems worldwide. So what I want to do is let me just share my screen with you. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. you can. I can. At least from my side. Okay, right. So the agenda that I want to discuss with you is quickly um, discuss the Africa Rail 2063 strategy, um, key success factor for this strategy, pain points impacting the strategy, the role of additive manufacturing in alleviating these pain points. Right, the Africa Rail um, 2063 strategy is uh, strategy for integrated rail network linking all uh, countries in Africa, allowing Africa to manage to expand manufacturing, agriculture, and passenger movement, and then improve trade on the continent. So that's a very important strategy going forward in terms of the um, African continent and linking every um, country in Africa via the rail infrastructure. So how what? What is important there? One of the key success strategies for that, or key success factors for that strategy is optimal asset utilization, because assets in the rail industry is very expensive. And in we can't just add um, resources to the problem if we've got low utilization. We need to um, implement strategies and systems whereby we can optimize the utilization of our assets. So how can we do that? And what can assist us in doing that? Now, the current pain points typically, and most probably you can um, see, you can um, attest to some of these pain points, aging of assets, and that's causing spare availability. Then long lead times when we need to order space from wherever we require the space from. Also, what we've got is due to the aging of the assets, we sit with a problem of discontinued space. So once we actually want the space, we can't get the space anymore due to the aging of the fleet. Then spare locations. Different rail companies need to support their own fleet. So let's say we go for the strategy and now we, um, we've got a, a, a rail fleet that um, operates from Tanzania. Um, they operate down to South Africa or whichever other country and they need to be supported in that particular um, country. We need to have um, spare parts there available. Then production technologies of the space. We've got different technologies that we manufacture the space. Obsolete spare parts. Um, once we, we've got assets that's going out of um, service, we then sit with obsolete spare parts because we need to uh, order additional space uh, in order to service our fleets. Then spare parts cannot be used due to improper preservation practices. Yes, on our system, we've got space, it's available, but once we want to use the space due to uh, the preservation practices that hasn't been followed, the space are either um, damaged or they rusted, or um, there's some sort of problem with it, 
and therefore um, we can't use those pairs. Then high inventory levels, warehouse space to keep the spares, and as we know, sometimes the spares are um, stolen as well. So what is the, the role then of additive manufacturing? First of all, additive manufacturing assists you now to manufacture the discontinued parts. So these parts can be um, reverse engineered. They can then be 3D printed in one of the technologies and that assists you to continue to optimize your assets. We can also take some of those components and due to the current manufacturing processes, we are bound with certain ways of manufacturing the parts. With additive manufacturing, we can now redesign these components and we can actually improve the performance of these components. The parts are also can also be produced close to the point of consumption. Then the beauty about additive manufacturing is we don't need to um, order um, uh, economic lot size from our suppliers. We can now order in lot size of quantity one. So if we need one component for a specific um, asset, we can only take that one component, we print that one component, and that um, changes our stock levels and the stock keeping units quite a lot. And then once the parts are digitized, we manage it in the e-warehouse, so we don't need physical warehouses for these parts that we can 3D print and we can manage it in, in that way. Right. So this is just uh, the next few slides. Are, I'm going to take you through some of the um, areas where additive manufacturing has already added some value in the railway sector. On this slide, you can see some of the components that has been 3D printed um, for rail coaches. And these are some, some of them are um, very basic parts, but the importance of this is these are the parts that uh, might be your eye movers. It might be parts that you now need to, uh, and with, as I said, with 3D printing, you can now print them close to the point of consumption. And that's anywhere in Africa where you've got a, a manufacturing ecosystem. Right, so this one gives you another slide of some of the components that um, can be 3D printed. These are um, rubber components and um, other plastic components that um, you can 3D print for, for the trains and for your rolling stock. This one, typically what we've got is where we've got um, spare parts that's, um, uh, that, that's discontinued. On this particular one, there you can see we've got this um, wiper um, washer and this little um, holder for your wiper washer. Especially what happens is those little um, seals or the, the, the cover gets stolen or lost or, or broken. And now we need to replace that um, whole bottle. The bottle is perfectly useful. We only need to replace a little cap. Yes, now we can take the cap, we digitize it, we 3D print it, and we, we solve the problem. Also what we've got is typically um, we can replace metal parts with polymer parts. We know that metal parts have got a street value. And sometimes those um, items are removed from our rolling stock. Some of those parts can now be replaced with metal, with, um, polymer parts and those uh, polymer parts, um, there's no street value for them. And that helps us to improve the operability and availability of our rolling stock. This particular one is um, when a train needs to go in for maintenance, we can print tooling and jigs. For this one, it's pretty much a case where the train needs to go in for, for paint and external paint. And then they've printed this little, um, little jig that they just put over the light they can paint over it, they can move it, multi they can use it multiple times. It saves a lot of time in terms of preparation and um, on maintenance time and cost that they've got with this. Okay, now this is just a quick case study that uh, will take you through um, Deutsche Bahn. Now, Deutsche Bahn is the leading, the leading railway operator in, in Europe, operating um, passenger and freight rail uh, trains across the whole of Europe. There you can see in a case of about seven years, they've added 100,000 parts to their 3D printing warehouse with 12 different technologies, and they continue to add more parts year after year. This has allowed them now to basically, um, anywhere in Europe where there's a problem with a train and they've got a 3D printed part, they can just send the e-file to that particular um, print, the credited printing hub closest to where the spare part is, is needed. They print the spare part, fit it to the um, asset, and the asset is uh, can operate again and move. Now, on the right-hand side, you can see there we've got um, pretty much, if we think about Africa, we now need to think about how are we going to create a 3D printing 
um, ecosystem throughout Africa, that we can also support our rolling stock and that 2063 strategy uh, going forward. Right, this is just, um, we all talk about uh, recycling and the green economy. This, can, this slide just gives you an indication of um, typical things that adds to the green economy. We can now print the parts, we can make it much lighter, so we save a lot of um, material and energy. On the production side, it's on-demand production, it's localized production. We can even take parts and we can repair the parts with 3D printing, then uh, material markings and recycled materials that we can use going forward. So the importance of additive manufacturing in order to support our stra the strategy of the um, rail in Africa is very important. And therefore, we need to think, how can we utilize 3D printing in right through Africa in making sure that we um, support our strategies for making rail more accessible and more useful going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Hank, for that very, very uh, insightful uh, presentation. Um, it's quite interesting. Um, uh, the potential, the potentials really of 3D printing um, in terms of particularly the maintenance of the railway um, um, rolling stock. Um, there's a significant potential there um, for cost reductions, but also for um, having those parts available, you know, to, you know, you know, for the maintenance of, you know, um, of the infrastructure. Um, I know at the beginning, uh, Mesela uh, mentioned uh, in particular um, the issue of ensuring that, you know, we have African solutions, you know, um, for, you know, for whatever sort of problems we have. I'm just wondering, because one of the, one of you, you posed the question at the end there, one of the questions you posed at the end was ensuring that we have that 3D ecosystem, you know, in Africa, you know, um, so, such that we can take advantage, you know, of this technology. Um, from your experience, um, the work that you've been doing, because I know you've done quite a lot of 3D printing, sort of, you know, modeling, uh, et cetera, you know, in, in, in South Africa. How mature are we? How far along are we, you know, in terms of having that ecosystem in place? And have you actually, you know, have you been producing any sort of 3D um, products, so to speak, you know, um, which perhaps, you know, can then be leveraged to develop, to further develop that ecosystem? Yeah, the important thing in terms of the uh, 3D printing ecosystem is that you need to get, um, you need to create a 3D printing hub in um, certain um, in countries um, that can be decided. 3D printing um, hubs is not just printing uh, components for the railway sector. That's basically we printing components for the um, um, aircraft sector, we printing components for the um, agricultural sector, for uh, manufacturing, spare parts for manufacturing. So once you've got this um, ecosystem in place, um, a lot of spare parts can be digitized and can be uh, printed. And that uh, uh, basically um, add to the, the other speakers as well, where it's important that instead of um, importing these spare parts, from um, all over the world, we can now start to produce these spare, spare parts um, locally in Africa, in the different hubs, in the different countries where we create these hubs. So currently, uh, if we talk about the maturity of 3D printing, that's um, uh, it, it, it takes some time for people to really think that you can now 3D print these parts. But once they really understand the value that these parts can, um, um, you know, uh, put in place and how it can actually change the way that we're going forward. It, it it changes the whole perception of people and then they understand the value of, because currently in terms of the way we understand manufacturing is we've got a specific um, way of manufacturing parts, but with 3D printing, uh, the sky is the limit. We can now change things. We can now do things in a different way and it adds so much value. And that's where we need to get people to, to understand it, to adopt these strategies and to adopt this technology to start to move forward. There you can see for Deutsche Bahn, I mean, 100,000 parts that they already have digitized as part of the 3D printing ecosystem. 
And those parts can be printed anywhere in Europe or anywhere, they, they don't um, operate anywhere else than Europe, but take that to Africa. Once we've got that in Africa, those parts doesn't matter where. Those parts are kept in the electronic warehouse and where the parts are, are required, it's just sent to an accredited bureau for that particular part, the part is printed and um, fitted to your um, assets and, and then off you go. So yeah, we just need to get people to adopt the strategies and um, but we can see in South Africa as well, um, the adoption process starting started to, to gain much more momentum and many more companies are actually now inquiring about the value of additive manufacturing going forward. All right, thank you, Hank. Um, I just, just before we leave this area of technology, I just want to um, maybe redirect this question again to Professor Inkofu, if he's uh, still there. Um, just uh, that from a, an industrial engineering uh, perspective, um, how does he see these um, technologies that um, that Hank has just talked about? Um, and perhaps, you know, are there any sort of transformative technologies that you might want to sort of mention as well um, that will have a significant impact or, or, or help the transformation of our railway sector? Uh, from my side, thank you so much, Hank. I think that was very informative. And given the, the state of the infrastructure in the continent, uh, we still need a lot of physical stuff, you know, and um, additive manufacturing, as it is known, is one of the best ways to, to, to solve some of the challenges that come with um, making physical components. Uh, I, I, I also agree with the notion that the, 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 these kind of technologies will allow Africa to leapfrog, um, whereas in some of these countries, the development has taken many years for it to get to where it is. Uh, if you look at the approach that was even alluded to by Hank in his presentation, that all you need is a file and capability the other side of the world. As long as you get the file, you'll produce the exact same part as long as you've got the skills to produce the part. So so, so I do concur that additive manufacturing is a technology that I think is Africa we need to embrace. Particularly also, if you go visit some of the countries in the continent, you discover that the, the rail systems they have are very old race rail systems. And in some instances, the, the parts are out of production already. So 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 there's a lot of um, uh, reverse engineering that needs to be done because maybe the drawings are not even there in some instances. So 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 uh, I concur in that regard. But I also want to 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 be quick to to indicate that I I've had um, I think in the past five years maybe three PhDs that have worked on the topic around um, additive manufacturing. One was actually from Germany. Um, so very interesting that, but they were actually working with a different organization from, from, from Dow Japan, but I guess it's an ecosystem as well. And, and, and one of the questions that we're trying to answer was, how do you use artificial intelligence to, 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 to ensure the quality of, of the parts that are produced? Obviously, additive manufacturing is producing parts layer by layer. So as you do that layer by layer production, sometimes you discover that there's a lot of um, weaknesses, particularly for metal 3D printing, um, which was the study that we we did. And, and, and we came up with solutions around how you can ensure that when you do when you do go about your printing, you, you are able to, to, to scan uh, whilst the printing is in motion. And, and from the images that you get, get a sense of the quality because uh, with additive manufacturing, quality becomes a very uh, important dimension that needs to to be addressed. So, 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 how do you scan this part? And by the time your part is produced, the quality of the part is at the right level. And more recently, um, the other doctor student was focusing on how how do you develop methods to 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 reduce uncertainty because additive manufacturing still does have have uncertainty. We've got machines that can produce parts 
but there's always a degree of uncertainty. So how do you deal with that uncertainty, which sometimes, especially for structural components, becomes a you know a slippery slope. But for components like uh, some of the ones that were being mentioned, whether it's um, um, small rings, uh, closing devices for for tanks, etc., uh, I, I think the opportunity is 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 big, and the opportunity needs to be needs, needs to be exploited. But through these conversations, I think we also need to ask ourselves: Are our higher education institutions ready? Are they producing the kind of graduates that can operate in these kind of spaces? You know, so so so. While we want to drive the technology, we also need to make sure that the skills get produced. We also need to make sure that um, our young people are also participating in entrepreneurial ventures with these new technologies. So while they learn the technologies, they also then participate and we begin to build these networks. And with the Rail Competence Hub that will be setting up in Pretoria, uh, our goal is essentially to leverage knowledge on these kinds of technologies to be able to, to, to provide uh, not just here in South Africa, but across the continent, um, people who are capable, people who understand the technology, people who are able to exploit the technology for the benefit of, of the continent, for the benefit of, of um, young people in the continent, and for the growth of businesses in the continent, because this is also about business growth uh, as we speak about it. So so from, from, from my end, I think edit manufacturing is definitely a direction to go in. Of course, there are other technologies like the artificial intelligence that I made reference to, and it can link to quite a number of um, points within the rail value chain, and we can leverage that as well. Um, the, the, the blockchain, uh, I saw it wasn't very popular in the poll, but blockchain also has, has especially if, 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 if we are thinking of traceability of parts in the long term and being able to identify maybe where a part originated and the authenticity of the the so-called parts and maybe also protecting the the, the 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 continental economy around the production of these parts. So 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 the fourth industrial revolution technologies, um um, um additive manufacturing definitely blockchain definitely, uh artificial intelligence a digitized infrastructure. I think all these are technologies that bring about possibilities to to to, to strengthen the the sector. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mpofu. Um, um, yeah, that was um, very, um, very interesting insights again into those sort of te um, technology that can um, help to transform, you know, transforming the um, the railway sector. When you were speaking, you mentioned, um, you asked the question about whether our universities uh, are producing sort of the graduates, you know, that um, will be required, you know, that can, you know, um, help to work in terms of you know um, transforming the, the the railway sector, which brings me on to another question, really. Um, and I actually want to address this to Ms. Sella if she's here. Um, I'm actually going to ask these questions across the different panels, but because we're on this first panel, I'll just address it to Ms. Sella. That um, from your perspective, um, because you kind of have a bit of a helicopter view so to speak, across Africa in terms of uh, policies in the railway sector and in terms of perhaps the issues that have been addressed um, and all that. Um, what do you see in terms, what do you see that's been currently done to address issues to do with uh, capacity building in the sector and ensuring that the technical competence is required, you know, in this sector um, being addressed? Um, are you seeing anything from your standpoint where you are? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I call I call them my kids, and actually, I was doing my intake for internship today. There are a number of students with honors, master's degrees that are out there that need to be absorbed into this very important sector. And um, that relationship between private sector and academia, it needs to be strengthened. Academia needs funding in order to do the necessary researches as, as to inform the future of what the railway um, skill would look like. And, and then also continually make sure that um, the, the, what is taught at university is not the old curriculum, but we need to also th uh, teach critical thinking because at, at times we need to find a way to bring it with our, um, our graduates. 
from where I'm coming from, um, it is important that uh, we note the important role that has been played by important uh, partners on the continent that do not view Africa as a dumping ground. And now we should take this one moment to, call, to, to commend and, and um, Alstom. Alstom has been fantastic. They have taken up the, the, um, the AU uh, resolution that uh, South Africa will champion the manufacture of rail, rail rolling stock for the continent. Um, they have not only um, taken that challenge, but they are employing locals, South Africans, Africans uh, in South Africa and beyond uh, South Africa, our brothers and sisters on the continent to do the work. So those are the type of partnership that uh, Astrom invests in, in academia, they invest in, in their people. And that are the type of partnership that will then make sure that what we produce in uh, academia is what is required for today and the future. Academia needs to, to be well supported financially to ensure that uh, the skills are taken care of. And I would like to get to a point where we stop complaining that there are no skills. No one is coming to save us. We need to create our own skills because we know what we want. Private sector needs to invest. With our side on um, the rail reform, everybody needs to, to contribute. There is no government that has the sole responsibility of uh, skills development. We will be putting a proposal to government that as part of the operator access fees, a certain percentage of those fees needs to go into skills development, needs to go into making sure that whatever we invest in today responds to the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Sela. Um, I'm going to ask my last question for panel one. Um, and actually, I'm actually going to round up by coming back to Hank. Um, and Hank, my question is following on again from the lead from Professor Mpofu, because he kick-started this in a way, you know, when he talked about, um, when he asked the question about whether uh, graduates were being, you know, properly trained or whether the curriculums, you know, um, address the issues that are required. And Mesela has uh, given examples, you know, she talked about, I think you said you had some interns today, you, you had a meeting with, this, with some interns today, and you've talked about some of the requirements and how you are seeing that. Now, Hank, you're in the private sector, um, and I'm going to be a bit poignant here. Um, um, Mesela um, talked about the fact that it's everybody's responsibility, right? It's not just um, one person's responsibility. Um, and being a person in the private sector, you are a private sector representative here. Um, you know, you've talked about these fantastic technologies, 3D additive manufacturing. How do you see from your vantage point, first of all, how do you see the skills coming through, right, um, to actually take up these technologies and work in those areas? And are there things that either you or the collective private sector is doing to enhance uh, those skills or to ensure that those skills are being sort of developed and are, and are being made available? Okay. Um, first of all, I want to um, say that I think the youth of Africa is ready for new challenges and they are open for these type of disruptive technologies where they ready to change the world and these technologies give them the opportunity to take that on and to really do things in a different way. Secondly, in terms of the private sector, we engage with um, SASOL um, and we've just, we, we, we're finishing now with the, the second cohort of um, entrepreneurs that we are training on 3D printing principles. We, we take um, entrepreneurs from the field and we train them in the principles and how to adopt these skills and how to actually take it out into the um, uh, marketplace and um, use these skills. So, yes, um, I think um, it's important that these skills, as we um, spoken about um, the, the academic institutions, they play a very important role to produce um, people that can take this on. But 
the most important thing is like anything in life, it's about the willingness to make the difference. And once you've got that attitude, we can take you and we can start to teach you the skills and we can take that forward. And that's the important thing. And I think, um, as I said, I think um, Africa and the people in Africa is ready for these type of skills because there's no reason why we can't do it. Uh, we just have to, to, to do that and make a success of that. And we can do that. Okay. Thank you very much, Hank. Um, I, I like the fact that you said, well, you, um, at least your company, I, I, from what I understand, you you are taking entrepreneurs, you're sort of, you know, um, teaching them these skills, you know, these sort of, you know, these new technologies, you're taking them through how they can apply that, that um, in their own sort of entrepreneurial um, ventures. Um, and, you know, that sort of spreads across, you know, um, across the private sector, obviously, you know, um, that's, a very good um, starting point and anyway, a launching pad um, for training people and for developing those technical competencies. Well, um, with that, we've come to the end of our first uh, panel, um, panel one, um, and I would like to very much thank the um, panelists, although we're all still together on this journey right to the end of panel three. Um, and, and we'll be going on to panel two right now. Um, we were meant to have a keynote. Uh, our keynote uh, speaker popped on, but seems like he's popped off again. So, um, yeah, I think he's gone off again. Okay. Um, so we're going to go on to uh, panel two, but just before we go to panel two, I believe we have a short um one minute sort of presentation um diana and chinedu we have one Thank you. Um, without further ado, I'll dive straight um, into our panel two uh, discussions. So as I said earlier on in my um, introductory remarks, um, governments right across Africa are looking to both modernize legacy rail networks, uh, but they're also looking to develop new greenfield railway lines. We also see landlocked countries looking for quicker and more efficient routes to markets. And as a result, there are numerous railway projects either being planned or underway right across Africa. These projects include upgrade projects of existing rail networks, new build projects, uh, pits to port projects where we uh, see projects connecting mines in some landlocked uh, countries to ports to export their minerals. We see uh, intercity rail projects connecting different cities, different towns. We also see intra-city rail projects, inner city rail projects, and we have cross-border rail projects. So we have all you know, projects right across the spectrum 
quite a number of them being planned and quite a number of them also being implemented and quite a number of them that have all, that have been successfully implemented. Um, in this panel, we'll be looking at case studies of some of these projects that have been delivered. Um, and to start off, I'll be introducing our distinguished uh, panelist for panel two. We'll be discussing the topic, transforming the real sector in African countries. Um, our panel two panelists are um, engineer Abimbola Akinajo. Engineer Akinajo is a chartered civil engineer and she is the managing director of the Lagos Metropolitan Area Transport Authority, Lamata in Nigeria. She's got over three decades post-qualification experience in design and delivery of major transport, both rail and road uh, infrastructure projects. And in the last 20 years, she specialized in railway infrastructure projects. Um, prior to her um, being the managing director of Lamata, she has also held positions at WS Atkins Consulting, Robert West Consulting, Floor Daniel Limited, and the London Underground Limited. Um, so we'll be um, she'll be sharing with us tonight um, her insights, um, particularly um, from her experience in successfully delivering some what I think are one of the most complicated uh, metro projects um, in Africa and even globally. Um, I'll leave her to talk about that later on. But anyway, you're yeah, welcome to the webinar, Engineer Akidro. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Excellent um, webinar so far, and really glad to be here. Thank you. Um, the next person in panel two uh, that I'll be introducing is Makgola Makololo. Uh, Makgola um, is the managing director of Alstom Rolling Stock in South Africa. Makgola um, has worked as a system engineer in various leadership roles for the Southern um, African Power Utility ESCOM. And she's also worked as a senior reliability engineer uh, for gas giants in South Africa, SASO. Magola has also previously worked as the deputy director general in the national government in South Africa, where she gained extensive experience in infrastructure investments, policy formulation, and regulation. You're very welcome to the webinar, Magola. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me. Next is um, Simplis Esso. Uh, Simplis is the Director of Central Development at CETA Rail in Côte d'Ivoire. He's also a public works engineer. He joined CETA Rail 24 years ago in 2000, the year 2000, and was the Deputy Transport Director there from 2003 to 2007. He became the Commercial Director there from 2007 to 2011, and the Transport Director from 2011 to 2016. Uh, welcome to the webinar, Simplis. Bonjour à tous et merci. Malheureusement, je ne peux pas m'exprimer en anglais. Je parle en français. J'espère que la traduction est bien faite. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so I'll be kicking off the panel two discussions. Um, we also have, we had anyway, a fourth panelist, uh, Mr. Soga Sona, who was meant to join us from India, but he's not here. Okay. Um, yeah, he was meant to join us from India. He's a senior export manager at HYT Engineering Company in um, India. They're an equipment manufacturer and they manufacture 99% apparently of the rolling stock used by Indian railways. But as I said, he's not here. Um, so I'll be kicking off the panel two discussions by calling on engineer Abimbola, the uh, managing director of Lamata. Um, well, just to give some background uh, on this, um, Lamata has recently implemented a new urban rail mass transit system in Lagos, and they are in the process even of um, implementing um, another project, executing another project. Um, so she's going to give us an overview of the project and, um, and some insights in the development and implementation of the Leg Lagos metro systems. Uh, Engineer Bimbola, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, Dr. Fanero. And good afternoon to everybody from my end of the world anyway, it's the afternoon. So um, like I've been introduced, I'm the managing director of LAMATA and LAMATA has the responsibility for implementing, franchising, planning um, and regulating public transport infrastructure in Lagos. If anybody knows Lagos, we're a city of about 22 million people. 
We're a very small space. Um, we're the smallest city or smallest state in Nigeria, but we have over 10% of the population of Nigeria. So you can get an, a view as, as to how densely populated Lagos is. Um, Lagos historically has had a very, very, um, shall I say, challenging uh, situation with its public transport system. And to that end, we developed a, a strategic transport master plan. And it is that master plan that we're now rolling out. That master plan is speaking to ease of mobility um, and also developing an integrated intermodal transport system that will utilize various modes to ensure that the people of Lagos get um, uh, adequacy of public transport and hopefully be able to have a sustainable uh, public transport system. So as part of that uh, strategic transport master plan, we have, um, I think it's six uh, metro systems and one monorail. And we have just recently completed and put into operations one of the, the first phase of one of them, the blue line, which goes really from the east to the west of Lagos. Um, that project we have implemented is um, uh, the full project is a 27 kilometer intra-city rail system, i.e. one that is just within the, the city. Uh, bearing in mind Lagos has congestion as its sort of footprint, everywhere is congested. This for us is a hugely welcome development uh, in the sense that we are now able to carry more people. So we're looking into mass transportation. Railway has that advantage. You are able to carry a lot of passengers um, in one journey and over a very short period of time. So you're reducing um, uh, journey times and you are ensuring, and it's also uh, from the perspective of the uh, environment, you are looking at reducing the number of vehicles on the road because more people are now put inside this rail system and so therefore the emissions are less. So there's a lot of positives for um, the a, a rail system as a major uh, means of transportation within a, an already congested city. And when you look at it for us, when you say that Lagos is congested, it is not just congested from a traffic perspective, it's also congested from a, a population perspective. So there's a lot of challenges trying to implement a rail system in such a space. Um, and so therefore things like um, establishing a right of way in itself is a, is a challenge because you already, you are trying to implement a rail system in an existing or in an already developed city. And so therefore that comes along with its own environmental and social impacts upon uh, the people. And those things have to be thought through. You have to ensure that the, um, the, environment, the environmental and social impacts are managed properly such that you do not um, cause too much of a problem to the very people that you are trying to ease their journey times for. Uh, a lot of these uh, implementing these railway systems is also the big problem is funding. Ensuring that you have financing for a project from start to finish before at least have a line of sight for where that money is coming from. A lot of um, African governments are struggling, but think about the fact that Lagos is a, uh, is a subnational. So for us, it's a it's 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 like a double whammy. We're not a, a country, we're a state. And but Lagos has managed to do this within its own funding and its own Nigeria and looking for money to fund this. So therefore, for for us, the implementation of this has really been um as it's been challenging, what it's also done is bring opportunities because wherever you talk of challenges, you will also see opportunities. So when we listen to the um, panel before, we're talking about skills, uh, ensuring that Africa can have those skills and be able to build. Uh, funding is a big challenge when we're looking at our universities and I really liked that conversation uh, when we're talking about ensuring that our our students are taught not just the old curriculum, but ensuring that they are able to um, be relevant in the now, uh, which means that we need to ensure that what we're bringing out of our colleges, of our universities are going to be pertinent to the development of this infra uh, infrastructural space that is huge. But we talk a lot about um, uh, unemployment in Africa. 
but we're a, we're a continent that is um, looking to develop infrastructurally. Now, when you look all over the world, this is how a lot of people were employed historically in the global north. So therefore, for me, the ability to see the challenges as also an opportunity for the young people. We spoke earlier about Africa being uh, a continent of the young and also the women. Ensuring that we have those opportunities because we're building, we have to build. And if we're building, we need to ensure that whatever we're doing, we're carrying our young people along, we're training them, we're ensuring that they have the skill set to make them viable in this new journey that we're embarking upon. So any which way we look at it, um, the challenges for implementing a real system in any city is also what will birth us the opportunities. Now, the, the challenge is ensuring that you marry those challenges with the possible opportunities that will come out of it, such that as a continent, we will reap very, very fruitfully from the labors of our um, infrastructural drive by ensuring that our young people are also employed. Uh, and they are not just employed, they are, they are trained, they're skilled, and they can compete anywhere in the world. And hopefully they will stay with us because we are developing a nation that, or nations that can be um, looked upon as where we all want to uh, remain in. So the challenges for us are obviously the cost of implementing. We've had that in, 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 in the um, railway systems that we've implemented. I mean, some people said to me, oh, you took you 12 years to build, but the point is we're here, it's functioning. It is a, it's a real system that is, we're doing 54 trips every day. And the vision is that we will continue to develop that real system and to ensure that we, we, we carry more passengers. And the position has to be, obviously the challenges when we're talking financing is not just in the implementation of the infrastructure, it's also in the procurement of, of, of rolling stock to ensure that I have adequacy of services for those who need it. When we did the study for the real system, we know we can move at least 450,000 passengers a day. Now that in itself is, is, you know, it's something that we know that we can do and it's quite exciting. But for us to be able to do those movements, I, we need more rolling stock. And so when we're talking about funding challenges, it's not just in the implementation of the infrastructure, it is also in the procurement of rolling stock. And the ability to maintain this infrastructure comes from ensuring that our young people are trained. And so when we are, and I, um, Prof was talking about ensuring that the contracts we sign take cognizance of the positive that should come out of it. So when we're signing any contracts with implementers, main, uh, maintainers and uh, operators, we need to be certain that we ensure that they recruit our young people. Now for Lagos, for Lamata, we've done that. Uh, we have an, um, an agreement for maintenance uh, with a Chinese company, I think, think it is, and an agreement for operations. But we have also identified that whilst we may start with a certain number of expatriates, you must train our young people. And what we're seeing is that they're being put within the system. Railway for us is a new, is like a new frontier. So we don't have... Um, uh, the requisite expertise. But right now we're seeing a lot of our young people being recruited within the um, space that we're creating. And that is something that we're really very excited about in Lamata. We're ensuring that the young people are being recruited. We're ensuring that they're being trained as well in various um, aspects of uh, railway um, operations. And that really is something that I think we need to be, as, as a nation, we all need to be, as a nation, as a state, as, as Africa, in general, we need to be headed in that direction. So I'm going to stop for now and allow uh, Dr. Faniron to continue uh, with other panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Engineer Kiaju. Um, those were very, very um, interesting and very useful insights, um, in particular with regards to um, intercity, um, sorry, intra-city mm -hmm. rail. I got, into, I got into trouble when I was discussing with Engineer Kiaju during the briefing, because I kept on saying intercity and yeah, she kept on rebuking me, but anyway. Um, so, um, yeah, but those are very um, interesting insights um, into the challenges with um, intra-city rail, inner-city rail. Um, 
but I, I, I particularly like how you sort of twinned those challenges with, with the opportunities. Um, and again, how we uh, addressed or how you are addressing or your organization is addressing, again, um, the issues of um, training uh, people, um, you know, and equipping them with the skills, you know, required to actually um, create, you know, and to, you know, to, to maintain this um, um, infrastructure. Um, you mentioned um, the challenges with funding, but also about how those challenges are not just about uh, projects, but also in terms of um, procuring, you know, rolling stock um, 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 itself. Um, I mean, you 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 touched on the fact that the 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 I'm not sure whether it's the the blue metro projects or uh, because you ha you have the real the blue line and the rail line. Anyway, one of them right. touched on the fact that that people talk about it, it. It took twelve years, and and yes, you know. Um, that that's just indicative really of the challenges in that sector, you know, uh, particularly the challenge, you know, with funding. Um, you can't start it, you know, until you have the funding, but there's so much that goes into funding. And we have a whole panel on funding later on anyway, on finance uh, um, later on, but you've, you know, you've highlighted this as a, as you know, as a key challenge anyway, um, in delivering those, um, those projects. Um, Anyway, um, so I'll, I'll just stop there for the time being. We will come back um, and, um, you know, run a few questions by you. Um, since we're talking uh, about um, inner city rail projects, metros, um, I, I want to call on Mark Gola now from Alstom um, to talk a bit about her experience in this um, area. I know that um, Alstom is currently involved in the Kinshasa inner city rail project, um, and she's perhaps you know involved in a couple of other inner city rail projects in Africa. So, um, Magula, um, the floor is yours to give us some of your insights, you know, into these inner city rail projects um, that you are involved in. She's still um, there. thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I can hear okay. you. I can see. Uh, okay, so so I think th thank you, and uh, and I think a very good uh, introductory remarks, um, and, and to learn a bit more about the Lagos the Lagos project. Um, I think from our some perspective, in terms of our experience, we we are um, currently involved in a number of projects uh, on the continent, um, in both in southern Africa, um, and and uh, in, in a number of countries, North Africa, Egypt, Morocco, Cairo. Um, and I think um, our experience really very much um, related to 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 what um, um, engineer Abimbola has been mentioning is that um, really there has to be um, a phased uh, approach in terms of designing um, the projects um, to ensure that you are uh, well aligned uh, with uh, your host countries or, or the customer country in terms of defining the right solution that is uh, not just commercially viable but also uh, um, socially acceptable. Um, um, to the to the to the population that you are designing it for. Um, there's a lot of consultations that need to take place upfront to ensure that there is um, total alignment um, in in execution. Um, what we have experienced, and I think Mesilla has said this uh, particularly in South Africa, is uh, um, a commitment that we make uh, when we start uh, projects um, in terms of one um, investing in the industrial setup um, to be closer to our customers. Um, we see this as a very important um, aspect of um, um, ensure, uh, delivering successful projects. So we've got quite a big industrial base. I think we've moved um, quite a bit from traditional days where we, you know, equipment was all being imported in country. Of course, as Hank was saying earlier on, scale is always an issue in terms of, you know, when you execute projects, you need to ensure that um, you are doing a, a, a project in a, in a commercially viable manner. Um, so we invest um, locally um, in terms of industrial capability uh, when we deliver projects, um, also depending on what is really important um, for the customer. Uh, we also invest a lot in terms of capability, capacity, sorry, and human skill um, requirement um, from a local from a local perspective. Um, we see that this is really important in terms of long term longevity and success in delivering projects so at, at, um, at, at EPC stage and also um, during O&M phase. Um, we think this is um, important to our customers, and I think it's important um, also for ourselves in terms of, of the teams that we have um, um, in, 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 in different countries. And I think we have done quite a comprehensive assessment in terms of an impact, the impact of these reports, uh, for, of, of these projects for both South Africa 
um, um, and, and in Cairo where we've done these projects to actually illustrate that um, the urban projects that we implement, um, the, the, the viability is not is, is beyond the rail project itself. There's other secondary benefits that we see um, in, in, the, in those countries um, related to jobs, related to real estate development that really follows um, uh, um, the development that comes, the decongest decong decongestion um, factor, um, and also the number of, of, of vehicles that we really think um, uh, play um, a critical role in ensuring that we reduce um, congestion on the road and ensure that rail remains uh, a backbone um, of, of, of transportation and mobility for cities um, uh, uh, to ensure that we have sustainability in the long term. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Mag oh, sorry. Are you still on? Yeah. No, so you wanted me to to comment on on Kinshasa. So I think um, yeah, yeah, uh, yes, Kinshasa, please, yeah. like 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 many other uh, cities on the continent, uh, is 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 yes in our pipeline of projects. We are working with partners like AFC to develop um, a solution for for Kinshasa. I think everyone who has been in Kinshasa would uh, would know the experience in terms of the density of traffic in the city, and uh, we think there is really a good opportunity. Um, for 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 us to develop um, a solution um, that would bring um, a, a traffic uh, reduction solution for 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 the city. So it's a project that that we are quite excited about. Um, it's it's still um, uh, some way to go in terms of getting to um, um, execution phase. Um, but there's good alignment between the partners, and uh, uh, we we're really excited to 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 get to to um, the execution phase um, of this project. Thanks very much, Magola. Um, thanks for um, um, shedding some light on your project in Kinshasa. Um, um, it's interesting that you know you've you've highlighted or you've mirrored quite a number of some of the issues raised as well by engineer Akinajo. You know regarding these um, inner city um, projects. One thing I found interesting in what you were saying just now is how um, you are localizing, so to speak, your industrial base, you know, in terms of, you know, um, turning out your, your, your rolling stock. I, I, I think that's a great, um, it's a great thing. Um, and I think that holds a lot of promise um, for Africa. Um, I guess my comment there or my is um, because we have people from across the continent, Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, et cetera, here is whether, um, I don't know, in their sourcing um, rolling stock, um, you know, whether they might sort of be looking down south, you know, as to what's, you know, as to what you guys have um, down south. Um, just out of curiosity, just one question. Is your um, is your manufacturing base based mainly in South Africa or do you have it elsewhere on the continent as well? So so we have um, um, a site, uh, a four sites in South Africa where one, the one site where we do the extrapolis train. Um, for Prasa in a ring fence JV, we've got a, a site where we also do the propulsion equipment for the Trex locomotives that we manufacture for Transnet. We also have a, a site where we do major components, so all the bogies uh, for, for for the extrapolis train, we do all of that um, in, in, in South Africa. Uh, we also have a, 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 um, a service site um, in Egypt where we are supporting um, Egypt, Egypt, Egypt Railways. Um, um, so, so primarily, our our sites are in in South Africa in terms of industrial capability, but we also have project sites that we are currently executing um, in the rest of the continent. All right, thank you. Yeah, but as I said earlier, on, I, I think it would be nice if you know some of the other sort of railway operators across the continent are sort of mm -hmm. looking at what's. I think this. Uh, I think this is the ambition of of uh, of the African Union um, in terms okay. of. Uh, uh, what you know, what what they've been saying in terms of you know finding a rolling stock manufacturing hub in the continent. As I said, mm -hmm. in this business, uh, you require scale, so it would it would be impossible to localize in each country. But we can collaboratively work in finding um, the right way to collaborate and localizing um, different parts um, of different products in, in in different countries. So so I, I think it is it's highly achievable. It it, it requires all of us to commit. To working together to ensure that you know we keep the industrialization on the continent, the skills um, and the jobs um, that are that are that are really employed in, in the production of this product. Okay, thank you very much, Magola. Um, I'll now go on to Simplis. Um, Simplis has been involved in upgrade projects uh, of existing rail networks, um, as well actually as uh, some new build intercity now, um, not intracity sort of you know 
connecting cities uh, projects, um, such as the Abidjan Kaya Railway, <laughs> and which actually extends into uh, neighboring Burkina Faso. Um, so simply, um, could you tell us a bit about some of these um, projects, um, some of these upgrade new um, real network upgrade projects that you've been involved in, and some of the um, new build intercity projects? Um, is simply still on there? Oops, he's dropped off. All right. Seems like simply has dropped off. Um, oh. Okay. All right. Um, simply was going to sort of give us an overview of some of um, the um, railway network upgrade projects um, that CETA Rail has been involved in in Côte d'Ivoire. Um, well, in that case, I'll I'll just um, perhaps wrap up um, panel two, uh, but with a question about um, infrastructure planning and design. Um, just and just generally, just wanted to ask our panelists. Uh, I guess right now it's. Magola and Engineer Kiajo, uh, whether from you know, whether from an infrastructure planning and um, design perspective, are there any particular sort of sustainable climate resilient features that are being incorporated into um, the next generation of African railway projects? Um, in other words, how are you as stakeholders addressing potential impacts of climate change? You know, in when you are developing and implementing your project. So uh, perhaps start with engineer Kiaju, uh, then if you want to. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Doctor. I think um, from Lagos' perspective, one of the things we've um, tried to do is uh, look at, um, when we're thinking about climate change, it's all about emissions and the mere fact that we are trying to move people from um, low density transportation to mass transportation speaks to a reduction in itself of um, huge emissions. Also, the fact that we are um, ensuring at least the blue line is a, um, an electric rail system, uh, which means that we're not, we're coming away from the diesel systems and we're going toward an electrified rail is also ensuring that we're reducing the climate uh, um, and the environmental emissions that are harmful to uh, people. And there's so many ways you can do um, little things to enhance your environment and the, you know, the, 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 the risk of climate change. So when I, when I think about, let's think about numbers now. So in Lagos, we have the possibility, well, most of my uh, journeys today are done via little buses called downfalls, right? And they would, I, say I have about 100 to 150,000 of those that are running around the city and spewing out carbon emissions. And I somehow managed to ensure that all of these get transformed into high capacity, preferably rail systems. One rail trip will carry nothing less than a thousand passengers. And each of those buses will take maybe 14 passengers. So therefore just providing a rail system in itself reduces the per capita um, per head uh, emissions that we're looking at. And then when I now make that um, real system function on electricity that is um, uh, sustainably sourced, we're looking even better. Now, there's another thing we should try and do is reduce um, journeys for people. And that means we should ensure that we enhance uh, connectivity. Uh, so instead of uh, I'm trying to go from A to B, I need to be able to ensure that I have given the people that as direct a connection as possible. So that planning, during planning, ensuring that you have connectivity that allows people to make their journey end to end with the least number of um, diversions or, 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 or changes also will look at enhancing uh, the, the, the climate for the people because as against, if I need to make a five kilometer journey and I am not having to do that journey in 15 kilometers just because I have zero connectivity, 
then I am ensuring that the climate is also looked after because the, so it's little things like that. So they're the big statements of, I am carrying more people in one journey. I am using electricity, but also ensuring connectivity brings about less emissions because people are spending less time on the road. I'm reducing their journey times. They're, they're doing less um, mechanized transportation. Also ensuring that access to my real systems are not just via mechanized systems like buses or whatever, but also micro mobility, make it possible for people to walk to my to the bus terminals, encourage um, non-motorized transport to major transport hubs. Those are things that as a city we're encouraging and all of those things will ensure that the um will ensure the sustainability of not just our of our transport system but also of the of the environment and and, and the air that we are all breathing in. Thank you very much, um, Engineer Kiajo. Um, I like that the fact that um, implementing the rail system it is in itself a climate change solution, right? The very fact of the fact uh, the, the, you know that the rail system, um, you know, um, carries much more people than you know than will be carried by the normal sort of um, um, other sort of modes of transport, and that itself reduces um, pollution. Um, and also enhances um, um, the environment. Um, Magola, do you have any um, things to add about, um, you know, in terms of infrastructure um, yes. planning? Yeah, yes, yes. yeah. Go ahead. Um, I, I mean, I, I think our, our engineer Bimbola started it quite well. So, so today we know that uh, the transport sector contributes about 25% uh, of global um, CO2 emissions. Um, and that if we intend to reach a net zero by 2050 as the ambition, of uh, uh, um, uh, by 2050, yeah, to reach net zero by 2050, then we need to increase um, uh, the share of rail as a source of transportation to 40% um, in the next decade. <clears throat> and um, um, today we see that about 67% um, share of rail um, as, a, as a mode of transportation globally. So there's quite a big ambition in terms of one, just a modal shift from road to rail in itself. Um, um, over and above um, the innovation that we want to see and that we are implementing in our products um, around you know, energy efficiency and so forth and improved operations to ensure that we, we reduce our energy consumption. So I think you know, the, 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 the first step is really to commit to a shift um, and, and not for the sake of it, but because it is the cleanest mode of transportation today. Um, it has the least emissions um, compared to the other modes uh, of transportation, combustion engines, um, and so forth. So it's, if, if we today increase um, the share of rail um, in transportation to about 10%, we simply reduce um, um, the CO2 emissions by one gigatons um, that can be avoided between now um, and 2050. So I think a commitment to really um, ensure that we make rail a backbone in all our transport master plans in the major cities um, on the continent would play a critical role in terms of contribution to slowing down climate change and to really start introducing some um, concrete response uh, measures um, in, 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 in the cities and contributing to, 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 to air quality and so forth. I think for, for, from an Alstom perspective, um, we, we really look at um, um, introducing key um, interventions um, and focusing on greener mobility, ensuring that our solutions have a 20%, 25% energy reduction uh, um, by 2050. So we built this into um, our design to ensure that our own operations run on renewable energy to reduce the overall footprint um, of our products. Um, and I think, um, you know, we, we, if we reduce the energy consumption, then we can make sure that um, the overall product and the global footprint um, contributed to by rail is further reduced. Mm -hmm. so, so I think the, the contribution really from a transport sector point of view is to ensure that we apply the right modes of travel um, um, to the right uh, to the right distances. Um, as Engineer Abimbola has been saying, it's it's important to ensure that we 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 use um, railway is appropriate long distance travel um, that is that is um, the right mode to be applying, um, and not ensuring that um, <clears throat> and avoiding to have passengers um, or all goods um, traveling on modes that really one are not appropriate for that use and also contribute to 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 higher levels of emissions. Okay, thank you very much. Well, so essentially, rail transportation is the most climate-friendly uh, yes. mode of transportation. Um, 
And that itself is a compelling reason to invest in modern railway infrastructure. Um, you know, that's that's on its own. All right, thank you. Um, I think I saw. It's gone. Okay. <laughs> That's so simple. Is there? He's, he's gone again. Okay, I'll just go on to um. All right. In that case, I'll just wrap up uh panel two, um, and go on to um uh, panel um three. And just before we start panel three, um, I think um, Ben and Chine do have a presentation that they want to put there. Dr. Segun, je suis là. Oh, you are here. There you go. He's back, everyone. <laughs> okay, just... De... <laughs> je suis là. Oh, okay. Je suis là. All right. Um, Simplice, um, as I said oui, earlier, on, he's, he's, he's implemented a number of um, uh, railway upgrade projects. Um, in Cote d'Ivoire, and I think he's, he he wants to tell us a, a bit about some of those projects. Simply, it's over to you. Okay. En fait, do, you have uh, your, do you have your presentation? Do you, do you want to do it? Or... Vous pouvez, je, je pense que je l'ai pas. Est-ce que Diana peut la présenter et pas passer pour les, pour les autres? Fait passer la, la slide de présentation. Je just, sorry, 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 Simply. Um, just before Simply, because Simply is speaking in French, so... um. For the panelists, if you could just um, go on your captions and uh, set it to English, um, if you know if you don't speak French anyway, and and also Diana, um, I don't know what you're doing for the um, attendees. Just make sure that you have everything all set up. All right, s s go ahead. Okay. En fait, uh, ravi de participer à ce webinar. Je suis désolé, je ne parle pas bien anglais, donc je suis obligé de m'exprimer en français. Euh, ce que je voulais partager avec vous, c'est un projet de, de réhabilitation de ligne de chemin, ligne de voie de chemin de fer les plus historiques du continent africain. La ligne Abidjan Ouaga a été créée en 1904 et elle a atteint, euh, elle a quitté, elle a commencé par Abidjan en 1904, elle a atteint la capitale du Burkina Ouagadougou en 1954. Euh, c'est une ligne qui a fonctionné, qui a connu des heures glorieuses jusqu'aux années 90. Et malheureusement, pour les défauts de paiement des États, la ligne s'est dégradée. Et, et ce qui a été fait en 1995, elle a été euh, privatisée. Et aujourd'hui, c'est une des premières lignes où elle a été privatisée. Mais c'est un affirmage qui a été fait où il y a un opérateur privé qui fait l'exploitation de cette ligne. Et les États gardent la propriété, de, de, de la responsabilité de l'investissement sur l'infrastructure. Malheureusement, euh, les États n'ont pas pu mettre de l'argent pour investir sur l'infrastructure. Et Dieu merci, depuis cette année, il y a un gros programme qui est mis en place par les États avec les, les bailleurs de fonds pour réhabiliter totalement cette ligne d'Abidjan jusqu'à Ouagadougou qui va faire à peu près 1300 km de chemin de fer en voie métrique avec la possibilité de moderniser l'exploitation. Donc voilà un peu le projet sur lequel nous travaillons. Aujourd'hui, nous, nous avons une charge à l'issue de 17 tonnes. Au terme des travaux, on passera une charge à l'issue de 20 tonnes. Nous avons des vitesses de circulation qui sont en dessous de 40 km à l'heure. Au terme des travaux, on passera à des vitesses de circulation de 110 km à l'heure pour le voyageur et 80 km à l'heure pour le marchandise. Donc voilà un peu les objectifs qui sont fixés à la réhabilitation de ce chemin de fait historique qui date depuis 1904. Nous sommes heureux de partager cette, cette expérience avec vous parce que euh, nous sommes convaincus qu'avant de construire, vu les investissements qui sont demandés pour construire de nouveaux chemins de fait en écartement standard, il est préférable pour nous, dans notre démarche, de réhabiliter les existants pour leur donner la possibilité de, de jouer leur rôle en, en, en pleine totalité pour que le système soit plus, plus performant avant de passer à un autre stade. Parce que euh, la, le, le système euh, en voie métrique, pour moi, n'a pas, euh, pas pu avoir la capacité de jouer son rôle parce que les infrastructures étaient dans un état tel que ça ne pouvait pas permettre aux états de tirer profit. Donc, pour moi, c'est un peu cette démarche sur laquelle nous travaillons, où la voie métrique actuelle est réhabilitée et elle permettra de répondre aux besoins des économies du Burkina et de la Côte d'Ivoire. Voilà brièvement présenté ce que j'avais à vous dire. Malheureusement, je suis désolé, je le fais en français. Et j'ai fait une petite présentation en français. Je vous, je, 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 je vous permets, je, je suppose que le secrétariat pourra vous la partager. 
et pourrez la traduire en anglais pour comprendre un peu ce que je voulais vous passer comme message. Vraiment ravi de m'avoir associé à ce webinaire. Je suis vraiment désolé pour la langue. OK, thank you very much, um, Simplice. Um, so, uh, he had a presentation, um, but I think we had problems bringing it up for whatever reason. But, um, yeah, Simplice um, has been involved in the... Um, uh, the upgrade of the um, Abidjan um, rail network, uh, right, Sim Simplice? Um, yeah. As well as there's the Abidjan, uh, I think, Kayad network, which has a branch that goes off to Burkina Faso, to Ouagadougou. Yeah. Um, from my discussions, he, from the briefing he gave me before, um, the, the, the main upgrade that they've been doing is upgrade to the systems. So it's, it's not so much the... Um, the rail line per se, it's the systems, the, the you know, the, the, the railway systems. Um, and that has been the uh, the focus of their upgrade, um, you know, the modernization of the uh, rail network in um, in um, in Abidjan. Um, it's, I'm sorry that we don't have the actual presentation here because um, he, he did prepare a very detailed presentation, which would have been very useful to um, for us. But if we're able to get it before the end, we'll, we'll, we'll put it up again. Um, uh, so that you can see the details of those different real projects that um, um, that he's done. So thank you very much, Simplice. Thank you very Merci much beaucoup. for. Yeah, thank you. You're very welcome. All right. Um, we'll now stop there for uh, panel two. Um, Diana um, and Chinedu, you have something um, to put up before we go on to panel three. Welcome back and welcome to the panel three discussions. Um, our panelists on panel three will be discussing financing real infrastructure projects in Africa, challenges and solutions. Um, lack of funding has been highlighted as one of the key challenges. Um, our, our panelists in panel two uh, mentioned that. Um, and um, it's been one of the sort of key challenges to the modernization and expanding of Africa's rural infrastructure and rolling stock. Um, with their finances constrained, a lot of governments in Africa are increasingly looking at um, public-private partnerships um, to fund and to procure uh, railway uh, projects. According to the Africa Finance Corporation, in order to achieve the railway network density that's observed in countries such as India or China, um, Africa will need to expand its network fourfold, requiring between $65 billion to $105 billion a year in investments up until 2015. Uh, excuse me. But again, figures from the African Finance Corporation um, show that in the two de decades from 2002 to 2022, um, only $11 billion <coughs> of private mm -hmm. capital has been invested in real projects in Africa. We see that single purpose pit to port that's uh, moving uh, minerals from, from the mines to the ports. Um, those sort of projects are proven able to attract uh, private capital, obviously because of the economic um, uh, viability and profits surrounding the, um, the minerals. However, real projects that seem to support or that aim to support a uh, much broader economic growth are struggling to find investors. Uh, Cross-border real projects in particular are being held up by funding issues. 
uh, there's been some mixed success with operating railways under concessions, with some lines failing to meet expected traffic volumes or performance levels. So in this panel, panel three will be addressing the question basically, how can Africa unlock funding for its railways? So I will now start by introducing our distinguished panelists for our last panel, panel three, who will be discussing um, that topic um, on um, finance for railway infrastructure projects in Africa. Our panel three uh, panelists are starting from Jose Cordovilla. Um, Jose is director and head of infrastructure advisory at TIPSA. Uh, I hope it's TIPSA, not TYPSA. I hope I got it right. Um, TIPSA. But um, TIPSA, anyway, is a consulting and engineering services group headquartered in Spain, uh, uh, but involved in the delivery of projects uh, globally. Jose leads a team of professionals who provide technical and strategic advice to public and private clients, the planning, financing, development, and management of infrastructure projects worldwide. He has over 20 years of experience in the field of infrastructure with uh, a special focus on public-private partnerships, PP, PPPs. Welcome to the webinar, Jose. Thank you for having me, it's a pleasure. You're very welcome. Um, our next panelist is uh, Rachel Hughes. Um, Rachel is director of Serbon Consulting based in the UK, um, although they have offices in uh, the UAE and the Middle East as well. She specializes in supporting operators and government clients on real businesses, on real business development and sustainability uh, projects, um, in particular to expand their business operations and to manage environmental impacts and reduce costs. Rachel has worked on projects which range from leading the development of the first ever carbon footprints of the UK railway industry to supporting the mobilization of the Doha Metro in Qatar. Welcome to the webinar, Rachel. Thank you very much. We also have with us on panel three, uh, Mesela Mlapo, who was with us on, um, who was also with us on panel one, and she'll be also joining us on panel three here. And um, well, we're also supposed to have Mr. Sheye wrote to me from the African Development Bank, uh, but they're having problems in uh, Abidjan with their power supply, so he hasn't been able to join. But uh, Mesela, welcome once again to the panel. Thank you. Right. So to kick off discussions on panel three, I'm going to call on Jose to provide his perspective from his transaction advisory experience of the key financing challenges faced in funding railway infrastructure projects. Jose, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I must say that although TIPSA is uh, particularly well known globally for uh, in Africa also for, for, for years, as a technical advisor, engineering consulting company, I'm, I'm here in my capacity of director for advisory services. We, we, typ we typically uh, advise on, on PPP deals and investment uh, transactions. So, I hope I can give uh, leave a few uh, ideas uh, from my my already long experience in in infrastructure project development and PPPs, um, and uh, a key one would be that uh, uh, first of all PPPs are pretty complex, uh, pretty complex arrangements, and uh, uh, it's uh, it's uh, systematically a mistake to to um, to regard the PPPs as a, as the holy grail. And we see this as you know, first thought that comes to mind uh, in, in you know in, in politicians and 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 develop and project developers or sponsors is you know how can I raise funding, how can I raise money, and uh, you know if if I don't have the the money then can can the private sector provide it, and the, therefore you know the next uh, thought is is go PPPs as as if this was a you know a one stop solution. PPPs are complicated um, arrangements, uh, and and this is proven by by uh, facts and figures all around the world. Um, and in railway PPPs in particular, are even more complicated because because they tend to integrate um, a lot of components, very different components. You know, heavy infrastructure and civil infrastructure. Uh, you know, superstructures, uh, rolling stock systems, stations. Um, all sorts of you know different um, uh, components that have 
very different uh, you know ways of financing and operating and then you know of course if you wrap them up as a single project that um, that creates uh, lots of interfaces and and so on so that's you know the the, the numbers say and the figures say that integrated full projects uh, you know if you want to uh, develop a really big railway project as a single ppp a monolithic contract uh, you know the the odds are against you uh, but that that's the you know that's the uh, sort of uh, uh, you know uh, bad news of the of the story the, the good news is that uh, you know we 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 have so far enough uh, history and insights to understand what is failing in the in the, in the ppps particularly in railways and uh, you know one has to be particularly specific about uh, you know the kind of projects that are targeted by a ppp uh, you know commuter rail um you know uh, airport links uh, you know mineral resources projects you know from pit, pit to port and etc though they have really different profiles very different you know commercial profiles really different uh, um you know uh, uh, strategic uh, uh, needs, uh, uh, profiles, etc., and and of course, uh, therefore, you know, financing structure or the possibility to become PPPs. So you have to be really, really careful about that. Um, the other, you know, the other principle, uh, you know, the idea that I want to leave on the table to to begin with is is this concept of uh, no matter how simplistic it may seem, this concept of uh, financing versus funding. You know, your financing is raise, you need to raise the capital, to put a structure to build a project and, and have it going. Uh, but then you need you need continuous funding to be be sure to you know to make sure that you recover at least a good part of the cost uh, of the capital initially you know to to repay your loans also operate the system efficiently and then you know being able to upkeep and renew uh, the system and and you know railways is one of these uh, sectors together with water I would say uh, where the capital intensity is is really really large. Uh, to begin with, so they they really they very difficult to to amortize and to 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 recover costs. But they, of course, they bring they bring a, a substantial socioeconomic value in the long term. So um, so uh, you this this concept of funding, which underlies the capability the, the ability to to finance projects. You know, are you going to be able to repay and cover the costs in the future? Uh, this concept basically has to be in mind right from the start and that means uh, and the way that you 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 move projects on uh, and in my experience is uh, the the driver for funding for uh, being able that you'll have the funding that will support your financing at the beginning is to have a strategic case is to have the right fundamentals of the strategic case from the beginning do you have the the, the demand do you have the demand do you are you addressing uh, are you providing the technical solution that will that, that will uh, bring uh, that, that will materialize the demand potential in a particular uh, you know commuter rail project or you know urban rail um, you know if if that project uh, is uh, structured uh, in a way that uh, it will uh, it, it will create networks of of, of uh, you know movements of people networks of mobility. That will, um, you know, that that will have uh, intermodality and will allow for for you know for the, all that mobility to to flourish and to develop in the long term. Then then you have a strategic case. If if you if you uh, are um, uh, if the project uh, has uh, demonstrably uh, you know a, a good environmental impacts and emissions reductions, uh, you know you create a green case around the project. Then you have a strategic case that will will uh, be more likely to raise uh, financing at uh, competitive. Uh, conditions in competitive conditions. So, so that that would be my thought. And and, and perhaps one last thought that um, uh, when you know uh, finances, the private sector goes for the you know for the for the uh, for the highest uh, risk adjusted return, meaning that you know even if the return is is uh, small, uh, if if uh, if it has a low risk, then then they, they will also there will be an, an investor for that. Uh, um, you know, pit to poor projects. Um, and, you know, uh, airport link projects, th th those are the easy, you know, the, the easy, the easy options. They, they tend to be commercially attractive, commercially feasible, and then therefore, you know, they, they'll run, they'll run smooth. But, uh, you know, the, the difficult bit, which is the challenge here, and I, you know, I encourage everybody to, uh, to, you know, to keep working on, on finding solutions to the big problems is, uh, is, is, is the, you know, the, the ones that are really difficult to begin with, but then provide the, the, the longer, the longer term, uh, benefits. And I, I would, I would point out, 
that uh, urban urban transport, urban transit in particular, is I think is the key to 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 the development of the African uh, railway system. Um, because simply because you know if if you invest in 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 urban and invest in the in the city, you know notwithstanding the the, the interventions that you can in rural environments, then then you're basically in creating creating capacity. You're creating human. Uh, human capacity, sophistication, you know, technological development, etc., which will then, um, you know, uh, activate the network effects as opposed to you know to single projects that are you know resource uh, resource driven or you know a specific connection to an airport. You need to to make sure that you create dynamics and critical mass uh, for your people. Well, thank you very much, Jose. Um, that was very. Um interesting particularly your comments on um ppp um generally um, um about how difficult they are um as you said um and that um in particular for railway projects because of the all the different parts to railway projects you know um how they could be very difficult i also noticed you talked about um the distinction between financing and funding and how even when you get the finance, you need to talk about funding, how you're going to pay back that finance. And in your opinion, based on what you said, um, that's um, the returns, that's my interpretation anyway, the returns from um, the railway operations, um, yeah, will take quite a bit of time, you know, in order to be able to pay back the project finance. Um, those are um, some very interesting um, insights there. Um, I guess that raises a question, um, and I'm not really sure who should answer this, uh, uh, since we don't have uh, other finance people there. But um, the question really is that you know, um, how can sort of business cases for railway projects in particular, you know, how can they be um, strengthened, um, and there's another question as to, I mean, you've given your perspective on this other question, but whether PPPs are even appropriate for um, railway projects. I'm going to ask um, Rachel if she has any comments on, on those. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I think, first off, I, I'm very conscious of the need to develop African-based solutions, so I can hopefully bring my experience in the UK and Middle East to avoid the, so we say, some of the routes that have been taken that have led to mistakes. So I think in terms of PPPs, so very often you see a huge PPP and it has to require a consultant. It's very complicated, so it's breaking it down, but then it's having a good length of time to develop a feasibility study in advance of having that project team that then go out to the market and having that as a longer term rather than it just being roll on and roll off because that there's a lot of lack of, of knowledge that gets lost. And on the point about how to develop a socioeconomic case, so in the UK in particular, there's been a huge increase in quantifying sustainability. So sustainability means lots of things to different people. But what has happened in the UK is um, requiring local jobs, requiring targets for, for example, um, small and medium enterprises in the supply chain and putting that, making sure that flows down throughout the entire procurement. So it's not just when you're buying rolling stock. It's also when you're going out to the contract for facilities management and having regular reports on that because that then really brings, you can capture, you can see the value because the challenge of rails compared to say bus or any other seriously less complicated mode of travel is that that legacy investment brings huge investment um, of huge benefits but you have to have a, I suppose, a committed project team for the long term and the challenges as well is always add contingency because although you can specify, for example, um, use of SMEs, you know, and use of different businesses, and then also you can even specify your placement days to encourage those that educational and get people into the rail as a career. Um, it has to be has to be quantified in contracts as well, and then managed appropriately over the longer term, and then that's captured. So using, for example, AI can speed this up in some cases because there are there's a lot of information. I think that's the, I would say those would be the two um, suggestions and making sure that that gets captured because it's so easy to talk about it. And then when it actually comes on the ground, having that contract manage, management perspective, then 
and then you can do a report like Alstom do in South Africa, you quantify the social socioeconomic benefits, and that also helps in terms of wider publicity. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks for um, for those. Um, I'm going to call on Miss Missella. Uh, Missella is a champion. That's how I describe it anyway. Uh, a champion for the Luxembourg Protocol. Um, Mercedes, would you like to explain this initiative and how it can um, help to unlock new sources of capital? Is she here? Oops, she's yeah, not here. It's, yeah, it's, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, thank I'm you. quite passionate uh, about, uh, about the law, the role of law, the role of lawmakers in uh, ensuring that uh, there are laws in place in this particular instance, international law and the unification of international to unlock investment. So the Luxembourg Rail Protocol is the, the legal, the global legal framework to recognize and regulate security interests for lenders, lessors, and vendors uh, secured by rail rolling stock. And if you look at the railway uh, project, you'll have the infrastructure uh, cost, and then you have the rail rolling stock cost. So if you want to split uh, uh, the, those costs where the, the protocol in terms of raising funds, in terms of ensuring that uh, cheaper financing could be, could, be, could be achieved. And I think the lawmakers from all states on the continent, have to agently ratify the Luxembourg Rail Protocol to ensure that laws are put in place that are of international standards to increase the investment that needs to come in and invest in rolling, rail rolling stock. Now, the, with the um, uh, prioritizing of the creditors' interest uh, um, for, from, from the protocol uh, perspective, uh, the protocol also um, um, allows finance financiers to register their interests and enable prospective creditors and, purch and purchasers to verify any competing claim on an equipment. And it means that um, it's not only OEMs that will be able to own assets, but there could be a leasing company that own assets that will be leasing to different states across the continent. And hence that interoperability is key to ensure that the train that comes from a Cape gauge or standard gate, uh, we have to find technological ways to make sure there is that uh, interoperability. But what, what is it? How, how, what is the relevance of the, of the, uh, the protocol? Um, and maybe perhaps if I can start here, you know, Africans um, are quite particular when there is anything that looks European. Um, with, with the Luxembourg Rail Protocol, it's an international treaty. It is based on the uh, uh, Cape Town Convention uh, uh, that was signed in Cape Town. So, Yes, it's, a, it's the law international treaty, but it does not have its roots in the European or, or, or American or anywhere else in the world, but it's international law that was established in, in, in South Africa. And the aircraft protocol also rests uh, on, on the Cape Town Convention. So that is quite uh, important for us to understand before we you know, push the, 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 the protocol um, away. So the protocol will then help to facilitate fin financing for customers, particularly countries with poor credit or lacking legal infrastructure to encourage creditors to extend support. Most of our uh, states or some of our state in terms of how the world um, rates us or those that in their finances, they will rate different countries um, on on whether it's high risk or low risk, but we need to find ways of um, using lawmakers, uh, bring them the tools that will then facilitate and, and inject uh, investment into, into, the, into the railways. 
to, to encourage capital investment, promoting and, and the expansion of the rail rolling stock manufacturing. And I think yeah, it is uh, is important that I need to come up strongly that um, when we put, when we introduce laws uh, such as the, the protocol, certain rules are a foundation of Africa, the Africa we want. The rail rolling stock manufacturing needs to take place on the continent. We need to increase African content on African projects. So the greater participation of Africans in funding will be key and to ensure that when we manufacture, when we uh, invest in these spaces, we also empower young, young Africans. The CFTA is it's, um, obviously one of the key uh, um, matters when it comes to policy development into intra-Africa inter -Africa trade. And uh, currently it's been reported that 0.3% um, of the total intra-Africa freight um, is currently, but with the implementation of um, the CFTA fully, we're looking at increasing the intra-Africa trade um, I mean, the rail uh, uh, portion of it by about 7% 7, 7 or so. And it is also estimated that um, the rail wagons that are required to, to successfully implement CFTA is about 36 billion US dollars. So, and hence that it is important that the manufacturing takes place in Africa for Africans to benefit um, uh, the, the continent. I'm, I'm a Pan-Africanist, but I, I love my people and I'm, I'm sure that no one will hang me for having a strong belief in, 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 in Africa and, uh, and Africans. So it is about the protocol you need unification of the private commercial law to ensure that we are able to raise funds as a continent to trade with each other, to make sure that when assets go across states, the creditor's interest is always protected. My ask on this uh, topic is that let us make sure that our governments implement and uh, ratify the Luxembourg Rail Protocol to the Cape Town Convention. ARIA and the Rail Working Group is ready to assist the governments in walking this journey. But we'll obviously start with educating lawmakers with the, on the importance of this international instrument. Thank you. Sorry, thank you, Mesela. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, those are very um, interesting um, comments and insights um, about the Luxembourg uh, Protocol. From what I understand, um, I mean, a couple of issues which you raised, um, the uh, it, you know about how, in particular, it's applicable to cross-border transactions, um, and how there needs to be um, common protocols in order to enable um, that protocol to be able to um, be um, be applied. Um, particularly to take advantage um, in um, financing um, um, situations. Um, I'll just call on some of the other members of the of panel three, um, perhaps to um, perhaps to comment on this and have their own comments. Um, uh, Rachel, um, do you want to comment on this uh, protocol and how it sort of um, flows on into um, uh, finance for um, for railway projects generally. Yes, of course. I think it's a it's a, it's a protocol that's been a long time in the making. I think that's one of the challenges of railway infrastructure is that decisions and the ratification of those take quite a long time then to happen. But I suppose what I wanted to do is also give an operational example of something that can be hopefully Africa could take advantage of. So, for example, when the Eurostar opened between Britain, France, and Germany. All the drivers need to have three rule books, um, one in English, one in French, and one in German. And this, they had to carry this around with them in a suitcase, so they had to pass all the tests, etc. And now in the GCC, there's a GCC rail 
network going across uh, several countries, including Oman, UAE and Saudi. And they're now looking at doing that digitally, all in one language and using infographics where possible. So rather than carrying around a suitcase, it also takes a lot more training. Now, I'm conscious that there are 20 years between this, but that's where you're thinking there is a chance of when developing this to take advantage of that and make it make it simpler and easier to do and also quicker. Um, and then that can also help to get people into the sector as well, rather, because that's another challenge of the Cambio as well, is that it can be quite complicated and it can be easier to invest in other modes of transport that aren't require less energy and effort. So I suppose that's where I wanted to give one example of that could be an opportunity for Africa. And also just in terms of wider sustainability business case. So one of my clients is the International Union of Public Transport. And in terms of when you put value, so a year of investment is there based in Brussels. Um, it works out on average, it's five euros of socioeconomic benefit. It's helping people get to jobs, helping people to you know, spend leisure time. And that's where it's trying to recognise that value, make sure that's captured as part of all the wider discussions around rail. So I just wanted to add to those because I always help. I think it helps bring bring it to life a bit more. Thanks, Rachel. Um, Jose, do you have any comments? Um, add yes. This question. Oh, it's 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 a good point. This about this uh, the, the Luxembourg, Luxembourg Protocol. I mean, I was I was actually with uh, we were discussing before this uh, event with uh, Professor Mpofu that we were at Dakar last year when uh, when the Dakar Declaration on Railway Financing was was signed. At an event uh, promoted by the uh, the, the African Union of Railways, and uh, and this this is this is actually mentioned in the in the declaration you know, in order to 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 increase the access to financing and, and de-risk uh, projects uh, you know the adoption of standards and this is a you know major one is is important um, now uh, it, of course you know it's it's, it's voluntary it's not, it's not it's not mandatory yet so you know it depends on the on the, on the countries that adopt this protocol. That's one point. And the, the other point I was going to make is that uh, but, uh, this is cr critically important for the operation and maintenance of projects, which comes to funding you know, and being able to, to have a, you know, an, ongoing, an ongoing and smooth operation of uh, you know, access to rolling stock, you know, not having technological issues or supply chain issues when, when it comes to, to, you know, to renewing your stock or to procuring your stock. But, but we also have to remember, uh, do some critical thinking that rolling stock in the majority of railway projects only represents around, you know, typically, you know, between 10 and 20 percent of the, of the initial investment of the project. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the larger issue of financing is still unresolved. Um, and, I, you know, I come back to a point that I made initially that I possibly, you know, didn't finish my, my, my point. Uh, I spoke about the difficulties in PPPs. Uh, you know uh, the 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 good the, the good news about PPPs is uh, I was saying that we we now know you know what what uh, kind of things uh, go wrong in this one you know I think the key one is that you know to try and go mono, monolithic for a whole project a whole railway project uh, as a PPP you have to come down to the specific components of the project that are best delivered by the private sector including the financing. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you a, a specific example. Uh, I hope it illustrates. Um, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't make sense that you know, if a, if if a railway project uh, you know has a thirty percent cost on you know on tunneling and you know large civil works, etc., why would you go to the private sector you know for, for private financing when it's more expensive than, than you know than issue you know than issuing uh, uh, public bonds, for example, or, or you know going for blended finance. Uh, to, to build and, and you know and, and repay uh, you know embankments and, and infrastructure that will last for other years and and that the, the private the private partner will have, will want to recover that that uh, investment you know within 15 or 20 years of contract uh, and 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 uh, you know that long term contract on the embankments is not going to provide any any you know specific value as opposed to the efficiencies that are brought in by the private sector when it comes to uh, systems and integration, intermodality, operation and maintenance, life cycle management, asset management, et cetera. So you, you have to go for the components of the projects where you maximize the efficiencies brought in by the private sector. So my, my recommendation would be to not think monolithically, be critical about the segmentation of a particular scheme, the railway scheme, 
and then I mean, coming back to the commuter rail or urban rail projects, um, the evidence shows that uh, it is is virtually impossible to recover the cost by affairs. Uh, the you know the whole investment cost and operational maintenance cost, life cycle, etc. So you have to recognize that part of the investment cost initially is going to have to be covered by public funds, you know, bilateral funds, multilateral loans, uh, whatever. Uh, and then for a for a specific portion where you will be uh, able to realize the benefit of bringing in the private sector, then go for it. You know, go for you know, technological innovation, go for asset management capacity, go for design innovations to the initial concept, uh, go for the commercial solutions to the you know, for, uh, transit-oriented developments, uh, you know, station management and commercial services at stations, etc. That's where the private sector, you know, will bring value that will offset the additional cost, uh, the, you know, the, the additional premium of, of uh, private financing. So uh, uh, that, that'll be my, my reflection. You, know, you have to, in PPPs nowadays, you have to be really specific about the components of the PPP, of the project that are bankable, not, not the project as a whole. Thank you, Jose. And again, thanks for the additional insights you again brought. Um, particularly in relation to um, PPPs um, and um, engaging um, PPPs. All right, um, with that, we come to the end of the last panel, uh, panel three. Um, we had some other things we wanted to discuss, but the, the specific people that we wanted to discuss, that, um, they're, not, they're not here. Um, so to round off the webinar discussions, um, I'm now gonna call on each panelist um, to state one thing, just one thing, uh, that if they had the opportunity and authority to do so, that they would change in uh, African um, railway infrastructure. Um, so we're going to use that in a sense to get some perspective of recommendations, so to speak, in terms of you know um, improving the uh, the sector. So I'll call on each person one by one, but the question is, and it's just to state that one thing, just one thing, that they would change in African railway infrastructure sector if they had the opportunity and the authority to um, to, to do so. So I'm going to start um, with Rachel. Um, and um, what is that one thing from your end? Well, the pressure of going first. I would say um, collaboration. That would be the one thing that would um, help drive change. And it's not just specific to Africa. I think it's across any 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 large scale, complicated projects that involve multiple different stakeholders. Collaboration. Thank you very much for that. Um, the next person will be Mesela. Mesela in Lapo. What is that one thing that you would you would change if you had the um, opportunity and the authority to to do so. Um, firstly, I would uh, make sure that Africa is a continent in terms of standards, manufacturing standard. We have um, one standard. Um, it goes back to, into interoperability. In some places, it's uh, a, a, a EU standards and different type of standards. As a, as a continent, we need to have our own standards that will ensure that seamless uh, logistics that need to take place. Um, the unification of the international um, commercial law is quite key uh, as, as a support mechanism for the CFTA. So that needs to, 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 to come in in order to, to unlock other opportunities. And, and um, with, with, with the, you know, the investment, uh, your triple P or how we call it PSP, Private sector and public sector have to find a middle ground. Why is private sector is required to, to develop infrastructure? Um, it, the government um, uh, objective on, on, on the reasoning of um, investing in infrastructure is different from that of private sector. So, and hence, that's why um, such projects become complicated because private sector in its uh, DNA is all 
about making profits, whereas government is different. So we're going to have to change our outlook on how we go into these relationships, that it must be that of partnership, not that that takes away uh, uh, from, from, from the governments, from the country and, and its people. And, and just in closing, the cost for rail rolling stock is about 30% of the project. If you can remove that 30%, from the project, then you you would then um, have de-risked your entire project and 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 have Ray Rolling Stock finance it differently. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Sella. Um, I'll call on Engineer Akiaju. She's there. Oh yeah. Um, thank you very much. I, I, I think I, I must concur with Masella. I have it written here that the one thing we must do is standardization. We must have uh, standards that are uniform across Africa, such that intercity, inter uh, cross border rails, and interest intercity ones will speak to connectivity. So the other thing I wanted to talk about is connectivity, ensuring that rails do not just stand alone. Rails connect with other cities. Uh, at least will connect an intercity will connect to an intercity, and an intercity will connect to a cross border rail. Because when we get that, then and only then can the functions of a rail system really become efficient. Because the rail system is not about moving you from A to B just. It's just ensuring that you can make all of your journeys as, as smoothly and as easily as possible. So I would say very clearly that standardization across the continent and uh, connectivity amongst the various um, uh types of rail systems that we have. You've spoken today about intercity, intercity and cross-border. Um, that connectivity will grant us more efficiency. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Engineer Kiaju. Um, Hank, I'll call on you now. Yeah, thank you very much. The one thing that I think is important for people to understand the value that additive manufacturing can add to um, standardization and to improving the, the um, rail system in, in Africa. Um, it's very important that um, we, with the new designs and everything that um, Elstom has spoken of, that the new designs take the value of additive manufacturing and design for additive manufacturing already into consideration so that that's integrated into the strategy going forward. Um, it's much more difficult to uh, change the strategy later on, but once you um, need to implement new rolling stock, you need to um, integrate the designs already for the new manufacturing strategies. Thank you, Hank. Um, I'll call on uh, Professor Impofu. Thank you so much. Uh, colleagues and thank you, Dr. Panirana. From my side, um, I think uh, the point that I want to make is I think we need to think youth impact. Um, it's it's the African continent that has the most youngest people in the globe. It's these young people that will ultimately use these rail systems when they've been established. The impact of these rail systems will change their lives. But has been has been raised continuously in the panel. Are they part of that economy? Or they are still going to be marginalized? Um, the future designs of rail need to come from these young minds because they are the ones that will make the globe function. Um, we, 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 the innovation that we speak about, whether it's about technological innovation, the standards we speak, the collaboration, it's the young people that need to be connected to collaborate. Um, some of us, you know, by the time some of these rail systems are set up at the pace at which they are being set up, will be gone. So if we're not thinking youth impact, I think we've lost it, maybe as a continent. But if, if, if we're clear 
in all the actions we, that we're taking, whether it's the financing, it's the collaboration, it's the technological interventions we're doing, it's the integration, it's the standardization. If we are clear on the youth impact, I think we're going somewhere. If we miss that part, I guess we have nothing. Thank you so much, Doc. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'll call on Mark Gula. Thank you. Um, I think for me, I, 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 I resonate very well with what Rachel said, which is collaboration. And it's collaboration across um, a number of dimensions. So if we want to be able to have uh, industrialization for the sector, we have to collaborate because the sector requires scale for it to be competitive and for it to, to be able to make sense um, for the different countries. So we have to collaborate. Um, if we are able to standardize the products, um, I think the industrialization becomes uh, much easier to achieve. And I think it becomes a lot more affordable. Um, and I think, you know, being able to put together packages um, that that would benefit um, um, the continent more, more widely and not individual countries uh, would really make um, a lot of sense. So we need to find a way to collaborate more and to find solutions um, that really improve um, connectivity across, but also improve um, the the products and the competitive of products that are that uh, the competitiveness of these products um, that are able to be rolled out um, to to different different sectors. Financing would require more or less the same the same approach that that we we, we collaborate if we want to upgrade main lines um, across the continent in order to to improve. Um, connectivity, we have to collaborate more. We have to deal with the issues around um, standards um, and the different policy frameworks um, in order for us to be able to achieve a, a common goal, which is a more integrated and connected uh, continent, which would enable um, a better trade, a better movement of people um, um, across board. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Magula. Um, I think the last, oops, where is he, sorry. Uh, Jose is um yeah will be our last speaker on this. Thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure, and I take opportunity to to thank you to thank my colleagues. It's a pleasure to share the panels with you. Um, I think my the the one thing that I would change or, or I would suggest is uh, to you know to to policymakers and 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 and, and funders is uh, when it comes to financing. Uh, Stop thinking about projects and think about the service and the outcomes. Basically, do go for financing services, not uh, not projects. You know, financing projects and, and building stuff is is one business, and then the the business of uh, you know providing long term services to to the people is another one. So uh, just make sure that you uh, when when you come to structure projects and bring private participation, make sure that you're financing outcomes and services, not projects. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, these have been very interesting statements from our panelists across the board. Um, I think I can kind of um, streamline them into um, sort of three different streams. Um, um, collaboration, um, then connectivity, and then the issue of the outcomes. And talking about the outcomes, Prof. from Prof. particularly spoke about, you know, youth impact. Um, but Jose has also mentioned that, you know, we look at the broader outcome in terms of the service being provided um, from the real sectors. Um, so thank you very much. These were very, you know, very, very interesting um, um, insights and, and recommendations, which um, um, hopefully will be taken up and considered um, by those who are sort of involved in the policy development. So we have a couple of key people here um, anyway. Um, we're not going to take a limited number of questions, obviously, um, because of the time. Um, um, so I have a number of questions that have already um, been submitted, um, which I'll I'll go through. I'll just really bring up three questions, really. Um, um, the first question actually is directed to Hank uh, by Kwame Gonza. Um, well, I'll just read the question exactly exactly as he's written the question anyway. Um, it's up to you, Hank, how you're going to sort of respond. But he's saying, um, who are Elogium's current customers in Africa or across the globe? And it's asking, are you based in Africa or Europe? No, um, I've answered that question. Basically, we are based in South Africa and we are 
currently um, working on customers uh, further up in Africa. Um, we're servicing some of the um, blue chip companies in, in South Africa, and um, we are working with them to roll our uh, solutions out to the um, businesses that they operate in Africa. Okay. All right. Um, next question is from Sad Chowdhury. Sad Chowdhury, sorry. Um, and Sad is asking, what opportunities are there for the diaspora who have experience of major infrastructure projects like HS2 in the UK? Um, I don't know if anybody in particular wants to take that question. Um, she's... So people who have experience in major infrastructure projects like HS2 in the UK, um, what opportunities are there available for them on some of these uh, projects? I can provide. I can comment. Uh, I can comment from an Alstom perspective. Um, uh, I think when you know, in terms of our deliveries and the the, the various projects, we are always looking for talent. Um, and if uh, they're looking for an opportunity, they're, they're more than welcome to to look through what we have to offer. Um, obviously, our ramp ups are always look uh, linked to uh, uh, to projects that we are we are executing, which we have a couple at the moment. So they can look through our website. Okay, thanks, Magola. Uh, Rachel, you were about to say something. Oh yes, I was just going to say HS twos are a really good case study for how not to run a project as well because of the cost overrun. Okay. So, yes, there's lots of good lessons learned that you can take and, and learn from. Yeah, well, I suppose it's a case of lessons learned that can then be transferred and applied elsewhere as well. Okay. Um, The next question is specifically directed at engineer Abimbola. Um, and it's in relation to, so um, are you able to give an update on the Lagos Metro Blue Line to Agbara? And how is it going with the Red Line Phase 2? And plans for green, purple, orange, and yellow lines. That, now that's about 10 questions in one, but um, I don't know. Is engineer Bimbola there? I guess it's somebody who's interested in, oh, she's gone. All right, well, she's not there anyway. Yeah. Well, uh, I think with that, we've now come to the end of the webinar. Um, I would like to say a very, very big thank you to the distinguished panelists and also thank you to the um, audience um, for, you know, for participating and attending the webinar. Um, we'll be posting the details of our next webinar on the events page of our website and you probably see it on social media, um, LinkedIn, um, et cetera, anyway. So once again, thank you to our panelists and thank you to the audience and have a very, very good evening, everyone.